Hello, good evening, everybody. We welcome you attending the second IBP masterclass session in collaboration with the UCLL School in Leuven in Belgium and our friends of uh, McCoy and Partners. We've, we organized this session to bring our students and customers more insight yeah, in the IBP tool that SEP has uh, created yeah, last year. In the first session, there was a general high level introduction of the complete IBP tool. Yeah. This year, we will focus more in detail on demand planning, exploring this part of the SNOP process. Before starting with the presentation, first some small advertising for our school yeah, in Leuven uh, in Belgium. Yeah. First, some practical uh, things. Let's have a look. Yeah. So all participants uh, are muted. Yeah. If you have questions, yeah, please enter your question at the right side. Yeah, in the uh, discussion box. Yeah, under the chat. No, under the questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. Then we will see it. Yeah, and we will uh, try to answer your questions uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. Afterwards, we will distribute the materials that will be used um, in the session. Yeah, via via mail. Okay, first a little bit about our um, postgraduate ERP. Yeah, so we have uh, an evening program uh, of one year, yeah, where in the first semester, yeah, we give a general introduction in the different basic modules of SEP, yeah, being FICO, MM, PP, SD, warehouse management, plant maintenance, and product system. Yeah, so it's quite uh, well, a lot of uh, modules. Yeah, uh, giving basic orientation to our uh, customers. Yeah, so that they can make a choice. Yeah, for the second semester or to focus on a sub certification in a specific uh, module uh, they want uh, to study. Yeah, um, they also yeah of course go for uh, customizing there. So it's a combination of functional knowledge customizing yeah to be an an, um, an SEP consultant internally or, ex or externally yeah or the second option is the sub key user where uh, somebody choose for more functional knowledge yeah in three modules for example yeah a combination of MMPP extended warehouse management yeah for example uh, FICO SD yeah um, for more, uh, yeah, the generalist um, who want to gain uh, functional knowledge. Yeah. Our target audience, yeah, are SEP consultants, internal and external. Yeah. Um, also, we have uh, a lot of uh, consultants who want to upgrade from SAP ECC to uh, S4 HANA. Yeah. So we are basically training on uh, S4 HANA. Yeah. Uh, we have the SAP key users. Yeah. We have SEP product managers yeah, uh, who uh, attend our classes, and also we see some uh, managers yeah, who want to strengthen their SEP knowledge. Yeah. Most of the time, uh, these manager levels, yeah, they go for the key user level yeah, because they want to have a more uh, wide, uh, a broader view on, on SEP. Yeah. So as already mentioned, yeah, it's about evening classes. Yeah. We also support a remote um, study, yeah. So we have everything uh, recorded, yeah, uh, and we can support uh, Dutch and uh, English, yeah. Uh, we have also an old system in ECC. So somebody, yeah, who says, okay, I want to strengthen my knowledge, but we still work on ECC. Yeah, this can uh, support it uh, this year. Okay, this is a general overview, yeah, of our program, yeah, so that you know that. Um, SEP, you can also learn SEP via school, yeah, at a quite democratic uh, prices, yeah. So if you would you be interested in our program, uh, you know where to find us. Okay, and then I think we can move to the presentation by uh, Caroline. You take over. Yes, sure. Can you see my screen? Yes? yes. Okay, good. So thank 
Thanks for your introduction, Willem. My name is Carla Gomez and I work at McCoyen Partners. Wait. Uh, and I work at McCoyen Partners as an IBP consultant. First of all, I will begin with a short uh, introduction of McCoyen Partners. Afterwards, I'll go to an overview of SAP IBP. And last, I will do a deep dive in IBP for demand. So let's start. McCoyan Partners is a consulting company that was founded in 2012 in the Netherlands and basically it's active in Belgium and the Netherlands. We are more or less 160 consultants and we are rapidly growing in the market. As you can see here, we have been uh, rewarded for our work and our projects several times. We also have different offices three and they are in Hasselt, Eindhoven and Utrecht. And uh, as a company we try to cover every topic in the SAP intelligent enterprise. We have teams for example focused in project management, sales and service, supply chain, finance etc. And of course we have a team that's only focused on SAP IVP. Our goal is to cut the edge between business and IT. And what does that mean? We want to see from the business perspective what makes sense. So we don't implement something that it doesn't make sense for them, that they will never use. And as an example, I can give my experience because before working in at McCoyan Plan and McCoyan Partners, I was a, a demand planner myself. So I really know, okay, would that use this solution or not? and most of our consultants have that experience too. In this slide, you can see also some of our customers and there are many different types. We have from pharma, retail, from the metal sector, etc. And of course, for some of them, we have also done IVP implementations. And now I will start with the overview of SAP IVP. So, as you know, in today's supply chain, there are many planning challenges. Planners face, for example, that they want to simulate assumptions in order to take the best decisions. They want to connect their planning with execution because sometimes it's not really connected. They want to shorten their monthly SNOP cycle. They want to manage the safety stock levels across all their network. Or, yeah, in the end, they want to have the right information at the right time. But in a company, there are many, many different uh, departments, for example, sales, finance, manufacturing, and they all need to be aligned. And that's really difficult if you don't have the good process or the good system to do it. That's why uh, integrated business planning appeared. What is it? First of all, integrated business planning is an extension of the principles of SNOP. What does that mean? That it expands its principles throughout the supply chain, product and customer portfolios, the customer demand and strategic planning in order to deliver one seamless management process. That's why SAP has also its own integration, integrated business planning solution. How does it work? First of all, it's a complete scalable flexible model. What does that mean? You have your demand, your supply, and your financial model, and you can check the data at any aggregated level you want or detail. Then you can also do real-time real -time what if scenarios. So if you want to check, okay, I want to check what would happen if I had this impact or this other one, you can check it and with that take the best decisions for your company. You also have the social collaboration with transparent communication between all the stakeholders. And finally, a really intuitive user interface. So you can always go there with via web, Excel, or any device you want. How does it work? Maybe you can balance your demand with your supply to attain the profitability goals. And first of all, you can, for example, do a consensus demand plan. You can do a capacity constraint plan. You can set your inventory targets to in order to see your stock projections through all the horizons. Maybe you want to do your executive review and do real-time analytics. And finally, see your revenue and profit impact. So, you have your demand, your finance, your supply, and your inventory. 
and how can IVP help you? In performance, performance management, you can calculate uh, KPIs at any level you want. And afterwards, you also have different dashboards that are totally customizable to check all the information. You can also create alerts with exception-based management and have full visibility over all your supply chain. You can also do the versions and simulations I was talking about before, and you can collaborate in order to align and have transparent communication. In the supply chain performance, you'll be able to increase your sales forecast accuracy, decrease inventory levels, increase profitability, increase your customer service level, and in the end, optimize your supply chain costs. And what SAP IVP offers that many other softwares don't have is the integration of financial data, which is really useful and important. So you'll be able to align sales, marketing, and finance, and see the financial impact and view it in all your SNOP processes, and in the end have a single source of truth within all your organization. As I was saying, you have your user experience, and it's really user-friendly. You have your Excel user interface, you have your web-based real-time dashboards, the online collaboration tool, which is called the JAM. You have the control tower to monitor your supply chain end-to-end, -end. and finally, the alert and exception management. And it's all real-time a scenario. And how does SAP IVP do that? It has six main modules. They are IVP for sales and operation, IVP for response and supply, IVP for demand, IVP for inventory, IVP for demand-driven MRP, and supply chain control tower. Let's see a bit what are they about. The first one of them and the core would be the sales and operations module. What does it do? Basically, it allows you to create an optimal business plan to drive your growth and increase the market share. You can balance your demand and supply, and in the end, do a functional cross-company plan using a single source of truth. How does it do it? You have your consensus demand plan. You can also do your tactical supply plan. You can do rough cut capacity planning, and finally, a financial reconciliation. As I previously said, you can do your version and a scenario management with the simulations and what if planning. And for example, you can also run your supply planning heuristics. You have basic statistical forecast models. And maybe, for example, you also want to manage the life cycle of your products. But now you want to go deeper. You want to even do more things. That's why you can also go to the response and supply module. What does it do? Basically, you can create a supply plan, supply plan covering all the time horizons in one solution, the strategic, the tactical, and the operational. You can create an unconstrained plan, which means that you don't have any constraints and it's useful to check the bottlenecks in your supply chain. Or you can also do a constrained plan, taking into account the profit optimization. For example, by setting the capacities in your factories or from your um, suppliers. You can also manage allocations and confirmations for optimal customer service, and you can also prioritize demands. How does it do it? It has a multi-level and order-based planning. You can do the rough capacity planning and also do deployment optimizing. Afterwards, you also have the demand module. What does it do? So you can deliver accurate mid-term demand plans for a better planning and execution. A really good thing is that you can, you can also sense demand on short-term horizons. Sometimes you have changes in your demand in a very short uh, horizon, and you want to react quickly to those changes. It also offers the possibility to run statistical forecast models and automatize them, and afterwards assign them to the, pro the products that have the best forecast accuracy with them. You can also improve your sales forecast accuracy and, for example, analyze your promotions, all with embedded analytics. Afterwards, we'll talk deeper about this module, so I will go to the next one. So you had your demand, you have your supply, and now you want to optimize your inventory with IVP for inventory. What can you do? You can reduce your inventory and improve your customer service level using its multi-echelon inventory optimization. You can shorten and complete inventory target setting cycles 
and in the end reduce your production and inventory costs. How does it do it? Basically, you can buffer your forecast error and demand risk, and you can maintain safety stock in the right place and at the right time. You also have the de demand-driven MRP. And what does it do? What it does is identify the coupling points in the supply chain and load them, and in the end do a demand-driven driven planning. And last but not least, our control tower module, where you can do end-to-end -end monitoring of the supply chain, taking into account the current and historical performance. You can create alerts and quickly identify potential issues in your supply chain. And finally, you can also collaborate with the different stakeholders in order to solve these issues quickly. You can integrate it from various systems and you can also calculate different KPIs, the ones you need. But of course, this was all theory, so maybe you are thinking, okay, does this really work? What happens with the companies that implemented these solutions? So here you can see some of the values. Later, Peter will talk about them more in detail. But as a first uh, view, you can see that the, they had higher on-time delivery performance, also the revenue growth grew, the service levels, and for example, the days of inventory and stockouts decreased. And now, maybe that was really quick, but if you have any question, don't hesitate to ask it. And we'll start with the IBP for demand overview. So, uh, as I was saying, you have your supply chain challenges, but also demand has its own challenges. Things go rarely as expected on the demand side. You can have high market volatility, you can have seasonal or intermittent demand, your forecast accuracy can be low, your, also your service levels, and maybe you have too much stock, and you need to multiply this for all your products in all your supply chain. And as a planner, of course, you, for example, want to rapidly simulate the impact of a customer demand change. And you want to react quickly, if, even if it's in short time horizon. Maybe you want to plan your data at any level of detail, or you want to align all the inputs in order to have a consensus demand plan. Maybe you need a more powerful statistical tool, or for example, you want to correctly plan the life cycle of your products. That's why this module, IVP for Demand, offers different key capabilities in order to deal with these challenges. You have, for example, demand sensing and mid and long term forecasting in one comprehensive demand management solution. You can do detailed statistical analysis of demand data via predictive analytic tools and automated exception based planning processes as well as manual planning capabilities. You can always do the ABC XYZ analysis and segmentation, and all these embedded on the fly with demand analytics. The value for the business. You can build a single comprehensive demand plan integrated with the consensus forecasting process. You can improve your service levels, reduce stockouts and lower expediting costs, uh, thanks to more accurate daily forecast, reduce your inventory targets by lowering your forecast error, and finally, anticipating planned deviations via embedded analytics. And this is the process that IVP for Demand follows. First of all, you integrate your data. Afterwards, you preparate it in order to do your statistical forecast calculations. Then you have additional processes, such as product lifecycle management or creation of promotions and events. And once all this is done, you can go to your consensus demand. Once you have it, you can check your demand sensing, and finally release this demand to your ERP. So now let's go, let's focus in each one of these steps. The first thing you can do is data integration. Here, maybe it seems very technical and tricky, but in the end, it's not like that. So you have your source uh, that can be S4 or any other system. And then you integrate this data to the CPI DS agent. If it's S4, it's direct, but if it's another system, you can do it via CSV files or database. There in the CPI DS agent, you execute your mapping and afterwards you schedule the integration job. So all this data goes through IBP correctly. 
and the same would happen if we do the reverse way. Now I'm going to show it quickly, uh, how does the CPIDS look? So here, for example, we have the different tables with our source data. If I go, for example, to the MATA table, I can see that it has different attributes. For example, the material number, the material group, the base unit of measure, the product hierarchy, etc. And I can also check another table that it might contain the same attributes or some difference. For in this case, material number or any other, depending on what we need. And once we have this data, the data that we want to integrate, then we create our project. In this case, it's MS7, that's our planning area for demand. And this one is for the introduction of master data in IBP. We have different tasks and for example, the product, we can view how did we do it. So we have our source tables, we transform the data there, and finally we get it to IBP. The transformation, how does it work? So we have our inputs and we can select what do we want to see in our output. For example, material number or base unit of measure. And we can also filter. For example, here we said, okay, we only want materials starting with them to be in IBP. And once you have done all this mapping, it's really simple. You only need to schedule the, the job. So you select your task and you run it. If everything goes as expected, in the status, you will get an icon that's green. And once you have your data integrated, you continue with the data preparation. In this case, we can start with the segmentation of our portfolio, ABC, XYZ. What does that mean? ABC stands for the product importance or profitability, and the XYZ for the product volatility or forecastability. For example, if we have an CX product, this would mean that our product is a low runner, it doesn't give us much profitability, and it's highly predictable. That's why we could say that this product can be forecasted automatically and our planners could focus more in other products that are less predictable and more important. For example, an AZ. And with that, with this segmentation, you can define your planning strategies. Let's see one example of how would we do it. So we are a brewery and we have different product types, bottles, cans, kegs. We also have a seasonal beer, a winter beer, and 0% alcohol beer. We have different four different product brands, Bavaria, Carlsberg, San Miguel, and Stella. Two customer types, pubs and supermarkets, and we deliver to four different countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Spain. As you know, we had a lockdown, and that's why our customer trends were a bit different. So during the lockdown, our supermarkets sold more and the pubs sold less or yeah, if they were closed, they didn't sell anything. And we're going to see all this information in our demo. So let's start. And our planner starts his day by opening Excel. There, he will log in to SAP IVP in our planning area, MS7, that's the one for demand. And he wants to start checking the profitability of our products. That's why he has a planning view only for that, and he will load it. So as you can see, here we have our actuals cost, our actuals profit, and an actuals invoice. And we have aggregated it per customer country and customer group. Here we see that in October, the actual profit is negative, so we want to compare it with the profit of last year. That's why we added our view. And we put the actual invoice last year in our planning view. We see that the key figure is there, but we also want to see it in our chart. So we add it here. And now let's check what happened with pubs. We filter, and then we see that the actuals invoice last year was higher than the actuals invoice this year, and that's because of the lockdown. We can also check it for the supermarkets, 
And here we see that the actuals invoiced last year are lower than the actuals invoiced this year. But now we want to do another aggregation. We want to see it per Denmark, and we also want to see our products of families. That's why we are creating another view and we'll edit it. So first of all, we add the category we want to see, the products of family. And since we are in Denmark, we also want to sort the beers for the most sold there, for example, the Carlsberg. Then we will also filter a bit more in our layout. We'll change also the currency because they they don't use euros. And finally, we'll filter per our customer country, which is Denmark. Now we have this new view with all the information we requested. And now in the chart, we can always say, okay, we only want to see our Carlsberg and we want to see the actual invoice this year and last year. And now we will stop working with the Excel, but we want to save the information. So next time that we come here, we we'll, can continue from this point. That's why we update our favorite and we save it. And now we want to check these results also in the web user interface. So let's go to it. First, we log on. And we have uh, created some charts containing this information. We saved it as our favorites. And let's check the profitability per country of every subfamily. So in this map, you can see our customer countries and we can see the profitability, for example, in Spain of San Miguel, in Belgium for Stella and in Denmark for the Carlsberg. Of course, this is in Euro, so we can always change the currency. And we can also check the profitability in Danish crowns. And once we've uh, seen this, now we want to do an ABC XYZ segmentation. So first of all, we need to check our profile. And as you will see, it's really customizable. So for example, in our ABC segmentation, we said that the calculation level would be at customer country product ID. We would take into account 52 weeks and we would use this segmentation method. You can also select different thresholds for your ABC and you also have different segmentation methods. In the XYZ segmentation, we can do exactly the same. In our case, we also calculated it per product and customer country. We took into account 52 weeks and we selected one of the calculation methods. And afterwards, we also selected different thresholds for our XYZ. Once you have your profile configuration, then you have to run the application job in order to get this segmentation for each product. So first of all, you create the job. We have different job templates, standard, that they help us. And we'll run it right now. So if all the parameters are right, we can schedule it. But maybe you don't want to run it right now, but you want to have it in a recurrence pattern. You can also do it. So you can define it. And for example, we want it to start on January 2021. At five in the morning. And we want it to run it monthly every three months. So we press OK, we check the parameters, and then we schedule it. And meanwhile, we see that our ABC segmentation, the one we run right now, it finished. 
So let's go and check the results. For that, we also have another chart. In our favorites. And here, for example, we can see that we have 13 AX, 27 CX, etc. And we can even drill down, we can go more into detail. So, for example, for our AX, we can get a list of the products per customer that are more forecastable and also more important for us. But we can also check this for other segmentations. For example, our, an AY, we have only three products and these ones are less forecastable. And finally, the AZ, we only have one product, which is very important for us, but not really uh, forecastable. So our planners will really need to focus on this product. And here it finishes the first demo. So we're going back to the process we were following. We were in our data preparation. Another thing you can do is to clean your history, because normally in your history you can have missing values, you can have outliers or promotions, sales uplifts, and you don't want them to affect your uh, forecast calculation. That's why you can cleanse them automatically or manually. Here you can also see how can you check these outliers or missing values, for example in the Excel user interface or by alerts. Once you have prepared all your data, you can start with the statistical forecast. Thanks to the time series analysis, IVP can determine a demand pattern for each product, taking into account its seasonality or its trends. You can also run a best fit model that will select the algorithm that best fits each product, taking into account the forecast accuracy. Let's check one example. So we go back to another demo. We are the same brewery, we have the same products, we have the same customer types and customer countries. But now we'll do two versions. We had our lockdown, in, but in the first version, there won't be a new lockdown. And in the second one, we'll have a new lockdown that started in October. In order to calculate the forecast, we'll start calculating the time series properties and change points. What is that? So the time series properties calculation identifies the properties that are used to filter out the algorithms that are not expected to calculate the appropriate forecast when using the choose best forecast method. So here in the image, for example, you can see, okay, this location product customer has a continuous with upward trend, for example, or the next one, an additive seasonality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these results are also considered automatically during the XYZ segmentation. You can also uh, do the change point uh, calculation. What does it do? It basically says when these trends are really changing and it's used as information to identify the reason why certain forecast models can predict the future less accurately. So we run this best fit model and we saw that the one that was best for our products in the case of the COVID effect, it was the Auto Arimax on or Sarimax. Why is that? Because it combines auto regression and moving average in order to provide real, reliable forecasts. And it also considers independent variables, for example, temperature. What does that mean? Imagine that when you have higher temperatures, you sell more, or when you have lower tempers, you sell less. Then this uh, algorithm will take that into account for the future forecast. So, we created this independent key figure, the COVID indicator, that for us, it's manually maintained per country, but you can really maintain it at any level you need. And it has two different values for us. It's zero when we have no impact of the COVID and one when it has a high impact. Why are we using it? Because if we have a similar event in the future, the forecasting algorithms can use this key figure to check the demand behavior in the past and then predict better the forecast in the future. 
So now we'll start with our first demo. And the first thing we'll do is check our forecast model, the one we created. We select our planning area. And as I said, we are using the Sarimax model. In the first tab, you can select general parameters, such as the, if you want to run it weekly or monthly, and also the historical periods you want to take into account. And in the forecasting steps, you can select the input key figure and also the target key figure. In the algorithms, you can also select different parameters. And for us, the ones that are more important now are the independent variable, the COVID indicator. Also, we want to consider the change points and consider the seasonality. And now we'll go to the time series analysis. So we run the job and now we're checking the results. In the time series properties, we can see if the products have seasonality and also if they have trends or not. And in the change points, we can also see when did that happen. Here you can see many examples. And we can also go more in detail. So for example, we want to check when did this happen and the magnitude of the change. And once we've done that, we can go to our planning view. As you remember, we'll start with our first version, version one, and here we don't have a new lockdown. So our, our COVID indicator in this case is zero for all the horizon. Here we have a data aggregation of customer country, customer group, products of family and product group. And as you can see, Last year, the requested quantity was zero in this case for this pub because we had the lockdown from March till July. We already calculated the statistical forecast quantity and more or less it follows the trends that we were having before. So now we can also check the data at any level we want. And yes, Maybe we also want to check it for pubs. And as you can see in the graph, there is no statistic, there is statistical forecast too, and we had zero, uh, request, zero requested quantity last year. We can also check different values also for supermarkets. And then we can also go to no seasonal products. You remember that we had winter beers, but now we don't want to take them into account. We will, we want only to see what happens with our 0% beers and our normal beers. And if we go to the seasonal products, here we can see that we only sell them from November till February. And the statistical forecast was only calculated for these periods. So now, uh, this was the version with no new lockdown, and we want to do the version two with a new lockdown. So we'll change our COVID-19 indicator. We go to it, this tab. And here we'll change in November, December, and January, the COVID indicator to one. We copy it and afterwards we save the data. We say it's because of the COVID effect that we are doing this change. And if we check another view, we can see that now the COVID indicator has also changed for all of them. And now we want to go to version two. That's why we can edit our planning view and go to the other version we have. Here you see that we didn't calculate our statistical forecast yet, but our COVID indicator is one. So now we're going to calculate the statistical forecast. 
we're going to run it for our lowest level, that in this case would be location customer product. And we'll run it in a weekly basis. Sorry, in weekly periods. Our forecast model is the Sarimax. We select our target unit of measure and the version we want to run it. And of course, sometimes you have forecast models assigned to some products. So if you have that, you can also check this box and they will be considered when running the forecast, not the one that we just selected. Then you can also go to the statistical forecast and check its status. In this case, it's still running. And then it's finished. If we want to see the new data, we need to refresh. And then we'll see that our statistical forecast is there. Here we can see the different values. And we can also check the data in our graph. Now let's see, for example, what will happen in supermarkets. And now we go to check the pubs. And here we have a curious situation because we see that we have statistical forecast in November, December and January while we are in lockdown. So we need to check why is this happening. We go to our non-seasonal products and here we see that the statistical forecast is zero. So the problem is not there. Let's go to our seasonal products then. So here we see that the statistical forecast is calculated there. And why is that? Because last winter we didn't have a lockdown period. So when the statistical forecast is being calculated for these products, the algorithm doesn't really know how to deal with it. Luckily, we can do manual uh, changes. So for at any level we want. So for example, in this case, we see that for Stellas, we have some quantities during the lockdown. So we change them to zero and we also change the ones in the in the future where when we don't sell winter beers we save the data and this will be the information that we'll send to supply of course we can do these changes at any level we want and afterwards save them and this was the end of this demo and we continue with the demand planning process. So you can also do your additional processes. The first one you can do is the management of product life cycle. You have your phase in and your phase out and you want to generate a reliable forecast for the new products. You, another thing you can do with IBP for demand is assign reference products during product replacement. So then you'll get a similar forecast for the new products. Another process you can do is promotion planning. You can load promotions from external system or you can directly create them in IBP. You can adjust them at any level you want and you can calculate the promotion success when, it's, when it is finished. And another thing you can do is the driver-based planning. What is a driver? Driver are business events that will influence your future demand. For example, you have your risks, such as a competitor or your opportunities, such a marketing campaign. So you can capture these risks and opportunities and view the impact of the drivers at any level you want. Once you have done all these additional processes, you can continue uh, to have your consensus demand. So you have your statistical forecast and then based on expert knowledge, you can adjust it from, for example, marketing or from sales. Afterwards, you can also calculate the forecast error by comparing the different forecasts to the actual uh, historical data. You can compare tendencies and trend and do different measurements. 
here you can also see that you can create different forecasts in order to compare, in this case, the statistical forecast with the demand planning forecast. And of course, it's an ad a really added value because you can see that the statistical forecast isn't always better than uh, the demand planning forecast. Afterwards, you can do your demand sensing. So you have your demand planning that it's based on forecasting. You compute your demand plan for the mid and long term horizon that more or less is one, two years, and you execute it normally monthly. So it detects seasonalities and trends over a long term horizon, maybe two years. However, demand sensing works with pattern recognition. So it computes a demand plan for the short term horizon normally from six to eight weeks. You execute it weekly, but also you can do it daily. And it takes into account short-term patterns over the last year. You can also see that it takes into account the seasonalities and trends from the consensus forecast. So you start, you have your inputs, then you do your pre-processing, and afterwards the demand sensing does the pattern recognition, and with the machine learning, you get the weekly sense demand and the daily sense demand. But let's see an example on the effect on a replenishment pattern. So without demand sensing, imagine we have three different customers. We work from Monday till Friday, so five days per week, and each of them asks for 5,000 units. So in our factory, we produce 15,000 units, and each day we'll send to them 1,000 units. However, maybe they don't really need 1,000 units per day. And with demand sensing, you can really sense that. So, for example, if on Monday they only want 250, on Tuesday 300, you can really detect that and optimize your replenishment pattern. So, as a summary, I hope it was clear enough. You can always ask your questions and we'll make sure that they are answered. The key benefits of IPP for demand are developed more accurate midterm statistical forecast. You can react faster to short-term demand changes with the pattern recognition based algorithms. You can drive more accurate deployment of product based and short-term demand. You can enable planning flexibility and accuracy throughout segmentation. And finally, you can collaborate to ensure the most accurate forecast. And now I'm going to handle the presentation to Peter. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Do you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Carla. I was really impressed by your presentation. So I think you did a, a great job for uh, bringing all this uh, to the, the colleagues in the call. Um, I will talk a bit further about uh, what we as SAP uh, think about the future of the product and give you also some insights on what are the main areas where we uh, invest on uh, for the further evolution on the IBP demand uh, product. So my name is uh, Peter Unis. I'm working for SAP Belgium for now 22 years, uh, mainly in supply chain solutions. In my current role, I'm solution sales for the portfolio of digital supply chain. Yeah, of course, the mandatory disclaimer, because we're going to talk a bit about uh, future direction of products. So that's a bit the mandatory stuff I need to make. So let me first start with an introduction. So uh, as Carla introduced in the beginning, IBP is a suite uh, of solutions where today we have some uh, specific focus on, on the demand, but don't forget there are other areas uh, in IBP as well. Now, if we look at it from a macroscopic point of view, there are several areas where uh, future developments are uh, being focused on. Now, uh, if we look, of course, usability is still one of these areas where we invest in. I hope and I think there are still people in the call who were uh, at the early adopters years ago in APO. Uh, that's, in fact, the original product 
where IBP is actually the successor product of. So if, if you can make the comparison between how it looked in, I, in APO and how it looks today in IBP, I think we made a, already a tremendous step forward, right? Certainly in, in terms of use of Excel uh, as, a, as a user interface. Now this uh, usability will uh, still be enhanced in future. When we talk about, uh, let's say, under the hood, uh, the advanced planning, I think uh, Carla introduced already some very fancy and advanced algorithms in the example. I come to that uh, later on during my, my pitch. But we will see that uh, if we look to the IBP product as such, there is currently also a lot of investment in synchronized planning. So really linking the whole supply chain top down from all granularities, all time horizons. Yeah? Especially when we talk more about SNOP type of planning towards really operational planning, even to scheduling level. Forecast automation, and I will highlight that into the the next slide because the topic for today is, is related to uh, forecasting. So forecast automation is definitely one of the major investment areas where the product uh, will evolve into in the next releases. Yeah, Forecast automation, if I say that, I immediately make a linkage to what we have below here on intelligence and visibility because how the solution evolves is mainly thanks to the embedding of new technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning. If you look to the heritage of how the product evolved, of course, we, we have a lot of different statistical methods which were already in former releases. But what we see today is that we get new algorithms being included in the solution. Uh, like, uh, as Carla showed in the example, for instance, gradient boosting is one of these algorithms that get a very prominent place already today, and also that will have a more prominent place into the future. Then looking, looking to the, the left-hand side, it's about seamless planning processes. I mean, if, if we talk to planners, uh, the wet dream of every planner is that there is seamless integration of all processes. And because although it's theory, <laughs> practice is sometimes far from, from that, is how we can align the different levels of planning. Uh, the, 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 the magical push to that famous red button that plans it all for you. Yeah. But what does it mean in practice? In practice, it means that uh, we see solutions uh, more evolving towards autonomous uh, planning solutions where the intervention of the different planners becomes less important and more on an exceptional basis rather than doing all the individual steps. What we also see is uh, the further integration to uh, the rest of our SAP portfolio. And there is one solution I, I, I particularly want to pick out, and maybe you know it by name, it's Qualtrics. Qualtrics is our platform that maybe you ever uh, used uh, in terms of running a survey. But in fact, it's, it's broader. It's about whole experience management. And you will see as, as one of the examples, how can we grasp this data in Qualtrics and use it also to make better forecasts. I quickly go to the next slide, otherwise I will definitely run out of time. <laughs> um, but if, if we look to how the solution evolves is that we come from an era where statistical forecasting algorithms, which are today mainstream, are being used, best fit algorithms, pick your algorithm, also what Carla showed during her demo. Demand sensing, it's something which is in the solution already for a couple of years, mainly coming from the retail environments. Product life cycle management, the introduction of new products. And what about uh, the history of old products or maybe similar products? Segmentation, forecast accuracy calculation, new algorithms, and I'm um, 
I think Carla <laughs> covered all these topics in, in the previous presentations. So where do we see now the next step? Because I can imagine people thinking, yeah, but we have seen it all now. Well, it's going into a further evolution in the time series analysis, where in current and, and previous uh, versions, we did a, still a lot of manual uh, intervention, or where we, for instance, in an XYZ uh, analysis, we attributed uh, what is a product A, what is a product B, what is the behavior of a product group X and Y. We go into a future where the system is going to detect that for you. Yeah. As I said, we introduce more and more machine learning algorithms since previous releases, but that will be definitely one of the areas where in future there will be uh, big uh, evolution still to come. Forecast automation, that's definitely the buzzword I, I would like to, uh, to put here on the table, where the solution takes more and more uh, the direction of going autonomous in everything which related to forecasting. Okay, whoops, I was one too quick. <laughs> Machine learning, I referred to it a couple of times already in the previous slides and if, if we look today, it's of course it's a buzzword and everyone is mentioning it on a slide, but I think today we are in a stage where machine learning becomes really core of what the system can offer, right? And today uh, we see customers already using in practice, uh, for instance, pattern recognition. And when we talk about demand sensing, uh, we talk about customers for improving forecast accuracy, but not only forecast accuracy with the traditional measures. I mean, those you can find in any statistical textbook like the MAPE, for instance. Uh, but today we also see machine learning being introduced as an important way to measure the forecast accuracy. Yeah. Visibility and exception handling. Uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes very difficult if you have thousands of products, uh, tens of markets, different countries, product groups, and so on, to focus on everything. So that's why we had introduced uh, exception handling. So by the definition of alerts, you focus only on what's going wrong or what's creating an exceptional situation. Yeah? And you will say, yeah, but that's already in the solution. Yes, it is. But it was all in a rather statically developed way. And you said, okay, for me, this is an exception if my outlier is starting at 30. Yeah? What is now actually being implemented and what is the further evolution is that the system detects what is an outlier and how it will deal with these outliers. Forecast automation and uh, what Carla showed for the example uh, with the beers, it was also very interesting because I think there also the gradient boosting algorithm with the COVID factor was uh, being demoed actually. Um, but in my view, this is one of the first times we have in our IBP solution such a kind of algorithm, right? And that will, I mean, gradient boosting, it's, 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 it's uh, a name of uh, well, a group of algorithms, so to speak. And definitely this will get a more prominent place in future releases where different variants, different tweaks of these type of algorithms will be used throughout the solution. Yeah. Master data, it's always a very important topic. I mean, your data is as, or your future data and forecast is only as good as your data that you work with. So also detections of anomalies uh, is very important in this respect. Also, uh, artificial intelligence is a key for further developments in this area. Yeah. What does it mean? I, I mean, I'm not going to read throughout the whole slide, but I think when we talk about use of machine learning, it's about 
three major groups. It's forecast accuracy, forecast automation, and it's about how do we deal with exception handling and how do we create visibility, right? And I, I refer to a couple of them. Huh? I mean, sensing, forecast uh, accuracy and sensing of the data is extremely important because you're bringing in additional know-how to predict what, for instance, a certain retail store needs to be replenished for. What does it mean? Well, concretely, it means that for uh, gradient boosting algorithms, we're using uh, and more proprietary uh, gradient boosting algorithms we're using to improve in that area. Recommendation is another way of how do we deal with forecast accuracy. Uh, for instance, in the automation area, remember that uh, those who are familiar with forecasting know that it's sometimes a very cumbersome exercise to find out what is now the best level on which I do my forecast run. Is it on individual SKU? Is it on product group? Is it on whatever kind of level? Huh? There will be a strong evolution that the system supports and guides you in the determination of that level. Yeah. New product introduction. Again, today, most static approaches are available where you say upfront, okay, my new product C behaves like A and B or combined A and B. Future uh, research is more in how can the system detect itself which products or similar products will be uh, a good candidate for representing your new products. Yeah, or not your products, but your product forecast, of course. I'm not going too much in, in detail because I, we will run out of time otherwise, but if I, I took one example here is in visibility and exception handling where with the static rules, typically a planner spent a lot of time if the thresholds are not defined well. I mean, I, I had similar experience myself where you have to dig in the morning throughout thousands of alerts because yeah, maybe your thresholds levels threshold level were not defined that accurate or well. Yeah. So that's a typical area where new technologies like machine learning can help you in detecting what are the appropriate levels for raising an alert. Yeah. Forecast accuracy, new forecast models. Uh, I think we uh, continue in those algorithms improving like, for instance, gradient boosting or the Sarimax algorithm that Carla used in, in her demo. Uh, I mean, today, really, this is in a, in a first release and there is more to come because as, as you will experience by using these algorithms, there is not such a thing like one solution fits it all. I mean, the nature of products, the nature of demand is different. So these uh, algorithms needs further uh, refinement. What the strength is, is that it is mainly focused on the group of regression models. Regression models where you say, give me those influencing factors that determine a certain fa uh, uh, forecast. Like uh, the typical example, if you want to predict what is the consumption of beer or, or Coca-Cola, yeah, is it vacation? What is it outside temperature? Is there an event ongoing? And that's kind of elements that these elements will determine what your forecast will look like. Demand sensing, I think this picture looks very familiar because I saw it in the previous presentation, so I will not stay too much on it. I only included it because demand sensing, yes, it's not new, but what is new is that especially when we come to the detailed forecast being generated, that also in that area, new algorithms are being introduced. And these are, for instance, again, from the group of gradient boosting algorithms, yeah, where indeed more sophisticated pattern recognition techniques are being used. This was an example for uh, 
a point of sales data typically from a store uh, but I think this again was covered by Carla's presentation. What I would like to mention here is uh, how for instance we can use yeah customer sentiment data uh, and that's where our Qualtrics platform comes into the picture meaning that for instance uh, if you if you have a good review of a product uh, people tend to post this on social media and you get nice reviews good reviews maybe bad reviews but all these elements may influence the buying behavior of your friends people that do research uh, reviews on internet right and it's possible by combining that Qualtrics data uh, remember the algorithms uh, regression algorithms this could be one of the key figures or the determining factors that you take into account when generating new forecasts I do consider this as an important step in the evolution of demand sensing so demand sensing by uh, the Qualtrics platform today this is not yet the case but it's on our development list to come in the future Gradient boosting, I mean, today it's, it's not a cause in machine learning uh, and I won't spend too much time on it, but for those who are familiar with, uh, with algorithms, it's a supervised learning method where we boost the solution by combining simple singular decision trees. And these decision trees are typically based on regression data, like for instance, the temperature or the COVID situation. Yeah, that's all I want to say about it. And yeah, this is also very similar to the, uh, to the example that Carla was elaborating on. Uh, so I think the COVID-19 situation is a very, very good uh, example on how this uh, typical algorithm is being used uh, because uh, you see a typical dip in the, or a drop in the demand and a catch up and with a normal or a, a traditional uh, forecasting method you never would be able to capture what the behavior is in that drop and how we recover yeah? so it's it's all about how do we create an acceptable forecast taking into account what is being uh, captured into the data that we get yeah and that's not all it's all about yeah but what is going to happen afterwards yeah because traditionally if i look to statistical forecasting methods well it will look to the past recent or longer time past but of course in a certain way this history has been messed up so we need a very smart algorithm to deal with these kind of changes in, in the slide deck I have some additional slides uh, included on it uh, but it, it's maybe taking us a bit too far uh, but do remember that these kind of algorithms are new are newly being introduced and are offering capabilities that we were not able to do uh, before Let's let's talk for the, a couple of minutes about value and value realization. Maybe uh, I included one slide because a, a question that we often get is how many customers do use IBP? Well, these are quite recent statistics and today we have more than 700 companies globally across all industries who are using our IBP solution in one way or another. And I think one figure for this context is important, that around 4,400 algorithms or forecasts are being triggered a day, which is tremendous. Yeah? And it's, it's steadily growing. So I'm, I'm very pleased when I see these kind of figures. Now, what I also will include in the deck is a link to what we call the supply chain planning compendium. And when we talk about customer references, this is an excellent document that is showing how customers are using our solutions and what they did realize in terms of benefits. Now, it's just as some backup, but definitely worth to have a look in it. Now for this session, I, uh, 
took uh, some figures which uh, I've stolen from our internal organization, which is called Value Advisory, and I used to work for them uh, before. It's, we're based on what we see happening at our customers and based on surveys that we run with our customers. Uh, we do so-called business transformation studies where we see uh, customers reporting a lot of benefits of the using of IBP as a product and IBP for demand in particular. Yeah. And I think Carla mentioned also in her uh, part of the story is that very often it's not only about, oh, we do improve our forecast accuracy. And, and typically, I mean, this is very company depending, very industry depending. I mean, if you can increase your forecast accuracy with 10%, 15%, I mean, this is really hard work i can assure you yeah but does that what does that mean okay we have a better forecast no I, I think the most important thing i want to mention here is that this has a direct impact on your top line and your bottom line meaning it increases your margin by three to five percent it increases your top revenue two percent and in the end you will have a better inventory so you're able to reduce your finished goods inventory meaning you don't tie up your money in stock that potentially get wasted or become obsolete yeah actually on on the left hand side this is what uh, syngenta reported recently on on a customer testimonial and i, I th well it's in line with figures that that i noticed from from other customers as well in the deck, I have uh, also included a couple of testimonials, uh, which you also will find in that compendium document. I, I, I just included them to give you a flavor on what is the typical benefit that they achieved. This is <laughs> very good. I mean, increasing your forecast accuracy in that order of magnitude, it's not usual. And it all depends on where you started from, of course. Another example, it's by coincidence also a brewing company. Uh, they reported a six percentage point forecast accuracy, which is not bad. And I, I think they uh, also achieved a very big decrease in demand planning effort, because let us not forget that Today, in a lot of companies, demand planning is still a very manual process, right? That is a quote from Syngenta, the ones from the quote on two slides ago. But in the end, where they see the benefit, it's in their customer loyalty because their forecasts are accurate. So they get the right products into their customers. Arla, Arla is a dairy company and also they improved in forecast accuracy with around 2.4 percent which is a more sensible figure that's something i mean i see for companies who have already a good level of maturity this is something which is a fairly good figure i mean the better you already are the more difficult it becomes to be uh, to become even better in forecasting but imagine what this means in terms of impact on your top line. Yeah. Tigre, Tigre, it's uh, another example where they focused more on uh, forecasting error reduction. Yeah. So also 16% that they reported and very much related to that one is that they achieved a reduction in inventory level by 30%. And how did they do it? Well, they squeezed in uh, the forecasting periods, they increased the forecast uh, cadence, they uh, used what-if scenarios, a capability which we have throughout the whole IBP suite, and in the end, also 9% customer service level. And they measured that in on time and in full delivery. Okay, it's a way of measuring it, but which is also very considerable. Some other figures also for your records. 
Uh, I'll try to uh, summarize it here for very different industries because yeah, you will see that some industries are more sensible for forecast improvement than others. And also the level of maturity is of course a very determining factor. To conclude, I have in this slide a, another, um, another link and that's our uh, Roadmap Explorer. Why I did include it? Because a lot of people ask, yeah, but what's coming next in the solution? And from an SAP point of view, we have a single point of entry where we list all the uh, upcoming solutions for, let's say, the next uh, three year of releases, huh? uh, where with less commitment, of course, towards the future horizon. But at least there you can get a good view on what is coming in okay, the IBP product, but it's valid for all other solutions, right? This was it from my side. I uh, would say uh, back to, uh, to Carla or to one of the other colleagues from McCoy. Yes, it can be to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, hello, Carla. Can I ask some Hi. questions? I have still some questions, and I uh, I think we have some time. I think. Yes, um, just let me show. Add. Let me show quickly just one slide, and okay. we can do it. So, um, I hope you can see it. So, I just wanted to tell you that yeah, we will have some next webinars, and I wanted to encourage you to join us. Mm -hmm. The first one is the SAP Innovation Challenge for IBP. And we are in the top three of this challenge with our perfect planning world. So we would like to for you to join us in the virtual award ceremony that's on Thursday, November the 19th at four. And we'll also do a session called From APO to Better IBP in order to know, okay, which steps do you need to take into account and how can I put my supply chain to the next level? And we also encourage you to join us. It will be on Tuesday, December the 8th at 4. And that was it from my side. So yeah, now we can start with some questions. Okay. Um, Carla, I've, I've, um, when you are discussing um, in the presentation, um, um, can can you also do forecasting on, on product group level and and afterwards do do disaggregation on on product level? Yes, yes, you you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So and and can you can you install rules there to to let's say yeah work on on the disaggregation uh, methods yeah that that you put some logic in it or is it based on historical data or no no you can uh, you can put the logic you want. Now we did it in for location customer product, but in the end you can work with other aggregations. Okay, okay. Then another question. Uh, suppose now that we are uh, maybe it's 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 more supply chain uh, a question, but suppose now that we are work yeah in different areas around the world yeah, and we have uh, we have a certain uh, demand uh, yeah demand process. We do forecasting and so on, but. Uh, the demand is coming from um, from from US, for example, yeah. While the the supply is coming from another area uh, somewhere in the world in, in in the world. So we have acquired an, an a long transportation uh, lead time. Is there a way of of yeah managing with this transportation lead time already on on uh, on the demand side, so that uh, on when you enter yeah, the demand in the mid long long run. Uh, let's say you generate a forecast. Yeah, that um, when you when you transfer the demand yeah to the supply uh, to 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 the planning, that's uh, you you take this transportation lead time into account. Yes, yes, you can do it. Okay, so so this is logic that you can build in uh, in the in the demand uh, on the demand side then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's have a look. Um, 
Okay. Well, some of the the questions I had uh, was already covered also by 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 uh, Peter. Um, so I saw that uh, you used uh, Fiori as an interface also to to IBP in combination with uh, an add-in on uh, on Excel, which is uh, when you have the the, the same front end for uh, let's say S for Hana and and for IBP, it's of course uh, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then on the demand sensing, so I understood demand sensing. Yeah, you you look to the short, you, you look to the the short term. So you have the forecast. Yeah, short term, mid long, long term. In the short term, yeah, you get uh, sales orders, uh, contracts from customers. Yeah, and in the demand sensing, yeah, you you define rules. Yeah, uh, priorities to customers. Yeah, to um, to bring your um, um your, your 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 produced material to the market yeah so if you have um differences between actual sales and forecast in demand sensing i i understand you can define the rules yeah um to to bring the stock to your to your customer to 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 have the the, the most the best added value yeah uh, looking to priorities looking to um to market share, to 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 I don't know, to profit. Is 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 that correct? Yeah, you can. The thing is that all these demand priorities, uh, you can really uh, deal with that in the response and supply module. There you can okay. say, okay, for this, yeah, for this customer, I really want to prioritize before this one, or you can put all these rules in the response and supply module. Yeah. Okay, and so it's not. Oh, sorry. If, if I may add to that, I, I think in, in my view and where I see the most added value of demand sensing is that, let's say in a traditional forecasting environment, you typically look to a certain level. Huh? You say, I look to a certain product or a product group for a group of shops, right? And where demand sensing comes into play is that you do in, in fact a refinement of a forecast based on yeah additional information and like the example i gave on what's the sentiment about my product in uh social media or what is the weather or what is uh additional point of sales data for instance if if my shop is, is located in a shopping mall that is opening and yeah you will get a boost in your projected sales yeah typically you will not detect that by just looking to your past sales and eh? because these kind of events are somewhere hidden in 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 the total data right so that's in fact the, the added value of, of demand sensing is that you enrich usually on short uh, term you enrich the forecast data that you would obtain by traditional methods okay mm -hmm. thank you thank you i don't know if there are questions other questions from the other attendees i don't think so but if that is the case they can always contact us and we'll make sure to answer them okay um okay then i think we are more or less at at, at the end yes then I thank you, uh, everybody, for your attendance. Yeah, um, my students. I want to bring my students a little bit more. I want to give them a little bit more body. Yeah, um, when I bring them to the market. So, so IBP, which is as such not yeah priority in 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 our study. Yeah, uh, but, but yeah, it gives uh, an extra a plus to the students. Yeah, uh, to make it uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, not a question if uh, some of my customers and and business partners are also i think in in the in the press in in the meeting uh, if they have more questions uh, about yeah demand planning or or other uh, sub modules of ipp uh, Carla, can can they contact you uh, for further queries or of course yeah 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 no problem okay okay um okay then uh, i think we um we can we can finish now. Um, okay, thank you all for this very interesting um, 
presentation, Carla. It was very good. Eh? I was also uh, very surprised. Yeah, um, very good, very good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, you're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.